so they were talking about creating an office of change management. And I just started laughing. And I said, y'all, if you create an office of change management, they're going to have meetings. You're going to bring in people. They're going to have lots of conversations, but I think it's the fastest way to get nothing done. No one wants to meet with the office of change management. That is not how things get done in an organization. And it's Stephanie Crevins, your host of the Hot Mess Hotline, where mid-level leaders learn to think like entrepreneurs. In today's conversation, we're going to talk about intentional change and what is required to create it, which is urgency, which is a sense of importance and we must move fast. The reality is, is, that, is that this COVID-19 hot mess global pandemic created forced an urgency on you, your team, and your business. And you all had to react quickly. You had to adapt quickly because there is no other choice, right? And there are some really great lessons that we can learn from this situation, from being forced to change so quickly. But let's also take the most important lesson from this situation, I believe, and that's how do we integrate, how do we integrate urgency into our business when there's not a flipping global pandemic and it's business as usual and we've gotten too comfy? That's what we're going to dig into. That's what we're going to dig into today. You know, this global pandemic has created massive change in a short amount of time. And during this entire season, I'm going to provide leadership and management tools that you can implement right after listening to every single episode so that you and your team can learn the hard lessons that we need to learn right now. We can emerge more resilient and focused, and you can learn to guide your team through change even when you're not forced to. You know, we're in episode number two of six for the first season of the Hot Mess Hotline. We're going to dive into the eight steps that you can learn so that you can lead and guide your team through change. And we're going to pull from the foremost expert in this area. His name is John Cotter. I want to point you to two resources that can help fill in the gaps here that we don't have time to cover in the podcast. He has a book called Leading Change. It's, it's a little older, but frankly, friends, it doesn't need updated. It's still current as ever. And if you're not into the couple hundred pages there of the book, he has a shorter article through Harvard Business Review um, of the same name. So Leading Change, John Cotter is the author that we're going to pull from, and I'm also going to integrate that with my client stories and how I've seen his expertise play out in the companies that I get to work with across the country. Right now, you need tools to make sure that great things come from this hot mess and that the lessons learned stick and that your business weaknesses get fixed. Let's get into the conversation today. In mid-March, just as everyone was frantically trying to get their teams home um, and working from home and, and running a functional business for most of my professional services clients, I had one particular client where their process of or really like what they had to go through to get their people to work from home was really heartbreaking. And here's why. Their client of mine, he is the director of operations for this organization with about 60, 75 employees. And he'd been trying to create measures with his IT team to create capacity to work from home, which is important, but also deliver the accounting functionality in a more digital way so that it was more secure. It was safe for the money that was being transferred, you know, hard checks coming in the mail, a lot of paper that is just not a secure way to to, to run business anymore. And he'd been working with the IT team to create the capacity to get people to work from home. And luckily that had been in the works. And so the transition home was relatively painless. But the piece that was really painful for this organization is that they had no way to process revenue and expenses without someone physically being in the office, which felt really, really unsafe in late March and early April of this year. And and required, you know, someone to really go above and beyond in order to run very normal business functionality. And he was unbelievably frustrated, as you can imagine, because he'd been pushing for this change with this, with this accounting manager for years. And the accounting manager kept pushing back, oh, this is going to take, you know, six, nine months to make happen. You know what he made happen in a week and a half? The ability to run their entire accounting function and department digitally and virtually. And obviously more secure, right? 
How frustrating as a leader is it to hear from your people that, oh, this is a six to nine month process. And when push comes to shove, you can pull it off in a week and a half. Now, of course, the process wasn't ideal and I wasn't perfect from the get go, but a nine month lead time to a week and a half lead time. That's the power of urgency. That's the power of accountability for making change happen. And so that's why it's step one of any major change initiative that that you want to make happen in your organization is you have to create and sustain a sense of urgency. Obviously, the global pandemic, COVID-19, obviously that forced our hand. It also revealed a lot of strengths about our business that we didn't know of. It also revealed a lot of weaknesses about our business that we didn't know about. Here's why we struggle on a day-to-day basis to create urgency. And it's because we get too comfy, we get too complacent in our businesses. You know, the reality is, is before this past spring, we were coming off years and record years of record business boom, right? So to be successful in business didn't even mean you were good. It, was, it meant people were buying what you had because the money was free flowing. People were willing to invest. People were willing to spend money because we were complacent. And here's why that complacency and that comfiness ramps itself up in your organization and makes change hard. We don't have enough honest conversations with our people about performance, results, the future, our values, vision, everything. You know, I live in Indiana and Midwest nice, Midwest hospitality is a thing that keeps us from having honest conversations in our companies and providing true feedback about what it takes to grow and develop as a person, as a team, and as an organization. More hard conversations will create more urgency for change. Oftentimes we're complacent because goals are too narrow. They just focus on a singular department And they don't focus on the results that are needed for a successful business. Teams need to be aligned in their work. And what what aligned means is that throughout an entire department or division, they're all working on similar goals. Their, Their processes build upon each other and create success. Integration then is when departments or divisions are integrated with other departments and divisions in organizations, which is the complete opposite of a silo, which is what we see in too many places. So goals need to be in some ways cross-functional, matrixed, if you will, like the reporting environments that we have nowadays. So if your people have matrix reporting requirements, we need to have goals that are matrixed as well. We also get comfy and complacent because in the age of data and the age of visibility to a lot of different numbers, we might be measuring the wrong thing. And it might just be too narrow, too detailed. It doesn't really tell us what success looks like. I want you to think about before the spring of 2020, where were your people? Where were you? Where were your business? Just too comfy, too complacent, not ready for change, regardless of where it came from. And so let me tell you a few of my tips where you can create an ongoing sense of urgency and energy to create change whenever it is needed. Because I'm a big fan of Cy Wakeman, and if you don't follow her, I really encourage you to. But what she talks about is it's all of our responsibility to be ready for change, to be ready for major environmental shifts, to be ready for major internal shifts, to be ready to up our game. That is our job as employees and as managers and leaders. So here are some tips that I wanna share with you about how to sustain urgency in the long term. So thinking about using a lean or an agile methodology in your business, and there's lots of those out there so they can apply to many different sectors in our economy. And then also using the 90 day sprint that I talked about in episode one is a really great way to stay focused on 90 day goals and the action plan that it takes to get there. The second tool to creating urgency is shared accountability. I work with too many leaders that take on too much work and then they're pissed because their people aren't pulling their own weight. Well, hey, dear mid-level leader, you've got to share the responsibility, the accountability, and the work and allow people to pick it up. If they don't pick it up, they need to find a new home. Another way to create shared accountability is everything gets a deadline and a person responsible. This, this tends to drive action in organizations like no other. So if you have a task or a project that needs to get done, it has one person's name by it, and it has a hard deadline for when that needs to happen. 
Another way to fight complacency is to remember what it used to feel like and be like as a small business and as a professional services firm to not be so successful, to get scrappy again, to not think that you have so many resources at your disposal that you really do. I've got one client I'm working with now, and we were in one of our team coaching sessions, and the CEO said, guys, we've got to act like we're a $4 million company again. They were on their way to eight, $10 million this year, and they had to shrink rapidly. He's like, guys, we're a $4 million company again. How did we, how did we get scrappy and resourceful at $4 million that we didn't have to at $8 million? Bring in an external coach to bring up those tough issues and force the hard conversations. Another way to create urgency is tell your people about the awesome future that's coming up, the trends in your industry, and how you can't participate because you don't have the infrastructure in place to make that happen. And then another trick of really successful uh, leaders that know how to create urgency for true change is set high goals that can't be reached with business as usual. So the old processes that people have been using, relying on, feel like old hat or, or just habit in your organization, those have to get blown up in order to meet these new high goals. And of course, your job as a mid-level leader is to make sure you don't let people off the hook for hitting those goals. No matter what happens, your job is to hit those high goals. We're going to make change happen this year. We're going to figure out what it takes to be even more successful. This season of the Hot Mess Hotline is brought to you by my Change Management Crash Course. This program is for the busy mid-level leader who needs to pivot out of this COVID-19 hot mess by creating new business results with an even stronger team. Go to changecrashcourse.com. Don't wait to become the pro troublemaker you've always wanted to be. I want to tell you about one of the best conversations I ever had in a corporate lunchroom. I was brought into an 800-person company to talk about change management initiatives for this organization. And it's it's a 800-person nonprofit in a very niche environment. And they were telling me about how the CEO wanted to create an office of change management. They had all these change initiatives going on because there's big upheavals happening in their industry. And the leaders that I were talking to see the future and see how the organization's ill-equipped to meet the demands of the future in their industry if they stay where they're at. So they were talking about creating an office of change management. And I just started laughing. And I said, y'all, if you create an office of change management, they're going to have meetings, you're going to bring in people, they're going to have lots of conversations, but I think it's the fastest way to get nothing done. No one wants to meet with the office of change management. That is not how things get done in an organization. Here's how they do get done. Guiding coalitions of leaders at all levels who have both formal and informal power to make change happen. Huge difference than an office of change management. I feel like an office of change management is like, we're here from the federal government and we're here to help. No one likes that. <laughs> well, some people do. I digress. But that is generally not the most effective way to get change done in an organization. And instead, you need formal and informal cheerleaders that are committed to the growth of the organization. So these are the folks that have the ability to truly manage in all of the right ways. Here's what usually happens with change initiatives within businesses. The CEO announces some grand plan. The vice presidents say, oh yeah, we're totally on board. The managers below that are like, I guess we're on board. I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do here, but we'll get on board. And then the people below that are left confused about what's actually happening. So then what happens is when we don't see the CEO living out the change, because he or she is human too, just like the rest of us, we use it as our excuse to give up. We're like, well, the CEO is not doing it, so then I don't have to do it. And what you're doing is you're putting the accountability and all the pressure on the top executive when it's everyone's responsibility to show up with the desired change, regardless of whether or not the CEO is doing it. This is radical personal responsibility and accountability that I want to invite you to for any change initiative. And this can happen within your department, within your whole organization. It, it doesn't matter. Your job as a mid-level leader is to create clarity wherever you can. 
and create the responsibility for change with every single one of your employees. And what's interesting in John Cotter's research is he points to actually the power and the effectiveness of mid-level leaders because they can actually make or break the change initiative more than the CEO can. Because you have way more visibility with the people every single day. You are in the work every single day. And people are watching you. They're seeing if you're living out the values. They're seeing if you're living out the change or not. So you actually have more influence as a mid-level leader than your CEO does during any change initiative. So here's how you create that guiding coalition that your business needs to truly sustain a big change project, something, something that's going to make or break the future success of your organization. And you can even apply this lesson to small changes that need to happen, right? Committees, when done right, are actually very, very effective. And that's what we're talking about here. So who do you want on that guiding coalition? Well, you want the right people who actually want and, ex and, and are excited for and will work towards that change for those new goals. They're willing to put in the work, the blood, the sweat, the tears, the overnighters to make it happen. We need their energy. We need their visibility for creating that change. We need their willingness to stick their necks out and push for it. So when you think about who needs to make up this guiding coalition, and when I say gui guiding coalition, it really does depend on the size of your organization. But if you have less than 100 employees, I'm talking five to seven people. They need to be from a variety of teams. They need positional power, so the right title. They need expertise in the work itself. They need to have a high level of credibility. People really trust and respect them and or they need to have informal power. These are the folks that, that other people go to for questions, for answers. They, they are highly trusted, they're highly regarded. They just don't have the title that those with positional power have. They also need to have management skills to get the results needed. So usually we talk about leadership in the, in the frame of leaders help unite people around values and vision and, and guide them towards the future managers are the people that know how to get the business results needed so that the company and the team can move towards the vision and the future. So it's a both and with leadership and management. It's not an either or, but we need people on this gu guiding coalition on this change committee that have the management skills to actually get the results needed by the change initiative. Once you have them gathered, make sure that you create time for team building and trust building because these folks always have to be aligned. They always have to be on the same page, speaking the same message across the entire organization. Otherwise, you're going to undermine what you're able to create there. And make sure that they work together frequently and people see that happening towards that common goal. We're going to talk about communication in later episodes and how important it is and, and frankly, how you're not doing enough of it. But this guiding coalition needs to be responsible for communicating a very aligned message. The minute that people think that they're not on the same page, it's going to slow down the work that you're trying to create or the change that you're trying to create. All right, friends, that's the power of a guiding coalition. You need a small and mighty group of people that are willing to put in the work, influence others, and, and guide and drive this change initiative through the organization. The responsibility is not on the CEO. It's on this guiding coalition. It's the way to make it happen. And then the respons responsibility gets spread out throughout the rest of the organization. So we've talked about the need for urgency with change and the need to gather the right people to make that change happen. I want you to think about two questions as you go about the rest of your day here. What are you going to do to create urgency for change when an external force like a pandemic or a recession are gone? So for you as a leader, whatever level you're at in your company, what are you going to do to create urgency for change as we move into the rest of 2020 and 2021. And then secondly, where do you need to get even scrappier? Where do you and your team need to get back to basics, get back to what's really important in your business, find ways to cut costs and pretend like you don't have the big budget at your disposal like you do. 
All right, friend, that's our conversation on creating urgency and creating that change committee that's really going to make things happen at your organization. At our next episode, we're going to cover why a vision statement just won't cut it to create change and how you can actually really, truly communicate change that will make it effective because I guarantee you're probably not doing enough as it is. And here's my last request of you, friend. Subscribe wherever you're listening. Share with another leader at work and sign up for weekly straightforward leadership tools at stephaniecrevins.com forward slash blog. And we'll talk soon.